Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and welcome to Expo Chicago, the International Exposition for Contemporary and Modern Art. Uh, my name is Stephanie Cristello. I am the Director of Programming here at Expo Chicago, as well as the Editor-in-Chief of The Scene, Chicago's International Journal for Contemporary and Modern Art. Uh, we just recently launched our seventh edition here at the fair. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Art Critics Forum as part of Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues is a year-round series of provocative artistic discourse, panels, symposia, and discussions with leading artists, curators, and critics on the current issues that engage them. Today, for the Art Critics Forum, we also must thank our partners, Art in America, for being such an amazing media sponsor of the fair, as well as Virgin Hotels for uh, very nicely hosting all of our critics. Um, today, the panel is comprised of, of quite a few people from various parts of the world, and I'm really thrilled to have them all here. Moderating the panel will be Ruslana Lichtzier, who is uh, one of my very first staff writers for the scene and has contributed to various publications um, and catalogs nationally and internationally. We have Robin Peckham, who is the former editor-in-chief at Leap, 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 Leap com, but just Leap. It's just Leap um, in China. And Diego Del Val Rios is at Terremoto. We have Anne Binlot, who's written for more or less everyone and travels the world all the time, but some of her publications include, some of her outlets include the New York Times, Forbes, and Gallery Magazine. And William S. Smith, um, who's with Art in America. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. So, um, hi, I don't see you. We do not see you, actually. Um, so it will be very interesting to talk to the void. Um, before we start um, talking about art criticism, um, we're going to narrow down the format of this panel. By So the way that it will work is that we're going to see four presentations that are images, mostly, and it came out of uh, Stephanie's really awesome idea to ask the writers to compose presentations that are of images, so there is no text. So first you're gonna do, we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna enter the conversation, which by viewing the presentation first, it also allows us to narrow it, to think about the relationship between image and text via what we're going to see next. So the next 20 minutes are going to be in silence. <laughs> and I do encourage you, though, to actually take notes because it is, um, it is an, a visual essay that each writer wrote. So there are uh, specificities of interest and aesthetics that you will see there. So enjoy.
So um, I thought to start, I shared with you a question, but um, I thought to start with a different one since uh, because of this experience and specifically because of uh, Will kind of closing the um, different presentation and that's uh, the question of silence and the fact that we as writers, we, well, I at least think that we translate something that does not speak. Even when it speaks, it does not speak the way that we speak to each other. Um, so we translate art into language by writing about it. And um, I wonder if you have a moment or do you hear silence while you're translating art? Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, what, what I did for my presentation basically was just to download the first 100 images on Wikimedia Commons um, under the category of moments of silence. Uh, just to see what that would look like, since I knew we would all be sharing uh, a moment of silence together. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you really do get a sense of the visual tropes associated with the performance of silence um, in all sorts of different contexts, but especially, you know, official commemorative contexts. So there's something about um, linking silence to power that um, seems to be important in these scenarios um, that almost like the silent moment um, is allowing for uh, lots of things to go unsaid, um, which can be very useful in, in those kinds of contexts. Um, in terms of the writing that, that I do, I mean, one of the frames for this panel was about um, John Berger and how he was able to communicate through images um, and he talks about the, the sort of stillness and silence that you can perceive in front of a painting um, and how actually like a reproduction of a painting or an artwork diminishes that somehow, um, bringing it into the noisier world of information. Um, and I think as we're writing today about art, obviously we're contributing to that, well, I guess you would call it ungenerously noise, um, but certainly there's an element there surrounding something that is still and silent and just existing for centuries with um, all sorts of chatter. Um, so yeah, I think about that translation mechanism a lot. And your presentation really touched kind of what Will is talking about, about this moment of, and I think that it also for Diego and Robin as well, is the moment of presentation and representation. The, mom, the, the fact that like you um, may be an advocate for Instagram and the way that it approaches more and more um, communities and people in the world and art is more accessible. I wonder if you see art um, being presented through via the vehicles of Instagram and online um, presentation generally is something that supports um, the, the, the art object or uh, as, in, as Will mentioned, it degrades from it or takes away from it? I think there are pros and cons to being on Instagram because on one hand, it's a way for the rest of the world to be exposed to art that they've never seen before. But on the other hand, it does kind of dumb down the field. So it goes both ways. How about you, Diego? What do you think about that? Well, specifically about social media or Instagram, what it has originated from that is an oversaturation of images that in, in one point, it silence itself the art. So you just have this whole amount of images which you spend seconds uh, seeing or putting attention, and at the end, that velocity is silence. It, it silence itself. The, the, the world, the, the world of art or the uh, artwork, in, in specifically, is just silent by the oversaturation of the image. It doesn't speak to you, even if we write about it or if we publish about it. It's, it becomes silent. Can I ask a follow-up on on that to Diego? Because I was curious about one part of your presentation which showed the Google image search mm -hmm. results, and they looked like incomplete results. And I feel like I didn't quite get the caption that was presented there. It had to do with 
the poor quality of an internet yeah. connection? The, so what, what I did, I uh, looked or searched in Google uh, contemporary art reviews or uh, reviews about contemporary art, uh, reseñas de arte contemporáneo latinoamericano y reseñas de arte contemporáneo. And with a low uh, quality internet, I try to access through the image. And when Google has poor connection, the images are ab abstracted by the most present color in that image. That it, that, so what we were watching were images of artworks, but with, through, the, through, uh, through the eye of the machine connected to a low quality connection. So that, that f through that, I was trying to also reflect of how, ac how art is accessed uh, in the global south with poor connections and in contrast with the global north. So when we're, when we're writing about, about art, who are we writing for? To that, to that uh, population or, or, those, or those people that have the privilege to have a, a, a high quality internet. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of people that are disconnected on the global south. So at the end, our conversation is just cycled in this access to technology. So I like that you're uh, kind of revealing this um, conceptual trope to, um, to express your argument. And I wonder, Robin, regarding your presentation, there was, um, was it a collaboration between, between you and, and the photographer? Yeah, exactly. Um, it was basically kind of presenting a visual diary of 10 days in the Shanghai art world, uh, during which a photographer who I used to work with a lot uh, for print media, uh, documenting features, kind of artist studios, things like that, happened to be in town. And so we said, okay, well, what if instead of uh, going to an artist studio and kind of documenting everything about how they work, we kind of work together and we imagine visualizing how a critic works. And so that was kind of, you see the studio visits, the exhibitions, the openings, the dinners, but also the kind of in-between moments, the family time. Um, and we kind of ar arrived at that because with this prompt, I felt like um, I wanted to have images that would not benefit from having captions. And it would feel really obnoxious if I sat there and said, and that's my daughter eating pizza, <laughs> and that's Emmanuel Perrotin at dinner, and right? Uh, so it's something that kind of doesn't need anything more. You don't have to know anything about it, whereas anything sort of conceptual immediately, you want to know what is that, and why did you include the blurry images, that kind of thing. So kind of getting rid of all of the information and trying to live in the experience, the visual experience. Yeah, I wonder how you felt about it because I think that this, like this assignment that Stephanie gave you, is kind of it brushes um, perhaps uncomfortably or perhaps very comfortably with artistic production. You're um, using images and not um, text to make a point, and there is a tradition of photographic essays that we are all aware of, obviously. So I wonder how you felt about. It, uh, if you felt like it gives you freedom or um, or not. You really turned the tables on us this time. <laughs> um, yeah, the idea of being that we would create something visual that would then be critiqued in public um, <laughs> is making me uh, feel empathetic or sympathetic maybe to some of the subjects of my own writing. <laughs> Um, which is fine. I mean, I think there is something freeing and, and very productive about the assignment, which is that I feel like it gave me a working definition of what bad art is, um, <laughs> which, which is what I, I think I created. Uh, and that would be, yes, like primarily an argument articulated through an image. So it's almost like if you start with the idea or the argument that you want to put forward and then that's the primary motivation that you have. Um, what you're going to end up with is a kind of quasi artwork like, like what I showed there. So it's an object lesson, maybe. Um, it got me thinking about um, auto fiction and kind of this idea that I think a lot of writers struggle with. Of, uh, and I think I read it was your piece in the new issue of the scene, right? You were talking about. Uh, the, the writer's role and kind of embedding yourself within the discourse of the work versus kind of purely engaging with the work on its own terms. 
uh, which I think is something that all critics kind of work with and kind of how deeply you can bring your own biography, how deeply you can bring the artist's biography, whether or not you should go back to kind of a new critical ideal of only approaching the work and its material conditions. Um, and right now, if you look at literature, pretty much everything that's good, or at least that people are reading from Sally Rooney to my struggle, you know, it's all kind of about the author's experience. Um, art criticism, I think there are some very interesting writers who are doing that, but they very rarely call it criticism per se. Um, you have sort of the auto-criticism thing happening. And I think suddenly when we go to images, we're forced to either go all the way in or all the way out on that. And it's, you're kind of removing yourself entirely from the experience or the images become images of what you see, like the found image versus the produced image. So th then I would like to ask, is writing about art a way of possessing it? I think it's a way to translate it to people who want to know more about the work because oftentimes when we look at a piece, we don't know what it's about and it's up to our own Im interpretations. And I think when we write about it, we're translating what, what it means to us. When I was when I was putting uh, the, or thinking around the presentation or the 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 task of putting together a visual essay, uh, the the first thing that I thought about is that if that there's there's a shift or a, or a split moment in which the printed work worth and the image the worth that becomes an image. So at the end, uh, majorly all critique or criticism is consumed in a screen that transforms that text into an image. And if the image that presents this text is not appealing, the text is not accessed. So I, I was more, more interested in that relation between how the image, how the text depends on the image when we translate it into the web, uh, so it can appeal to the viewer and it can be read and consumed and accessed. If that, if that image doesn't appeal, your review or your, of your essay just goes by in the feed. So this relation of how the word becomes an image and depends on an image uh, at the same time, I found it very interesting. So that's why ma major, uh, all, all the images that I, I put together were through Google image search. So it, it was just this logic of how uh, a very naive or very uh, easy way of going into uh, the art uh, discourse or narratives can be accessed through the image was, okay, let's Google that, contemporary art reviews. And that what that, that's what we were pulling off. Ironically, I was having a low quality internet connection. So I was like, "Oh, interesting. <laughs> hmm. Okay, let's do it. Let's do this then." So that that's had an interesting tension. At the end, we depend on the image of the work that we're trying to describe. So, how do you feel about that? I don't, I don't know. Well, Even you, that you also write. Oh. <laughs> no, no, please, please. <laughs> Well, I mean, what's, what was fascinating to me about the low quality internet connection that you were conjuring through that piece is you were suggesting that the image wasn't really accessible. Um, but you could maybe take, go a step further and say, okay, well, text could flow more easily through a poor quality connection, right? And historically, text has been, you know, moves more easily. Uh, the image, w the reference image was the rare thing that, you know, you need to have plates in a book or, um, reproductions were very expensive. Uh, and so mi you were sort of evoking that condi condition again in a contemporary way. So the question is, is, the, is there ever going to be a text that could be enough where you wouldn't need to have the reference image there? Is there a rich enough text that would sort of slide through these poor quality connections that would evoke the image enough to um, be satisfying? Well, I think that it's like a beautiful question because we're kind of touching on the boundaries of how we define an image and how we define a text. Because what we can also say is that the moment that Diego experienced the low res, uh, the low uh, quality internet, you experience a new image that you investigated further. So these, and I, I, I it, can, it can sound like a just a, a, a kind of an exercise in theory, but it actually, I find it very important to think about again and again how we define images and text because, um, well, I was bringing up this term. This term that I discovered a while ago uh, is something that both Benjamin and Adorno used. And for me, it's a very interesting term because be 
specifically with Benjamin's work, it's something that is very apparent that it's a, a person that really was in love with images, excited by images, and thought through them. So it is interesting to think about what do we do as writers um, when we are, do we collect texts as we collect images? Do we explain images or we uh, experience them through language by writing about them? I think that these are interesting kind of outlines to to highlight, and I wonder if you have anything to share out of your experience. I think that there are two ways to look at art. You can look at a work of art and come up with a conclusion, like your own conclusion as to what it means, and you could go into it knowing the background story behind the work, and I think depending on which way you go, it, it can drastically change the meaning of the artwork. Do you think that there is such a thing as an, like, an objective meaning to artwork? No. Okay. It's all in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so, so as a writer, it, so how do you define objectivity of a writer then? Well, as art writers, our job is not to be objective, is it? What do you guys think? I think that the since we're writing or since we're uh, publishing or disseminating uh, text about art, at the end it's very subjective. So uh, as you say, it's, the eye, it's on the eye of the beholder. So when you write about the art, it's inherently your own personal experience and your own context and your own background that will, up, that will build that, that description or that projection of yourself in the work, uh, thinking it to the audience. So you're, you're always in that text. You're always, be, you're, you're inherently, you part of that text personally when you're writing about, about the work of art. I thought Robin's presentation really did a nice job of capturing that because it laid out a very subjective experience of seeing art, right? It's um, the glimpses that you catch before and after, the people that you're with, the relationships that you have, all of that is surrounding this encounter with a painting which can sometimes be almost peripheral to the experience. And, it seemed like that was the case in many of the images that were shown here. Yeah, for me, I think that's a really important part of kind of recognizing the role of the critic. Um, and when we talk about images, I guess I was initially thinking a lot more about uh, uh, kind of layouts and working in the magazine world and the quality of the images that you're using. Um, and I was thinking about how over the last couple of years, there's been a tendency to print fewer and fewer installation shots. Uh, because you just don't get enough information out of it. And the, the w images that are considered to be informative are kind of the details, the close-ups. You, know, you even have magazines now, especially like the painting journals, that will have like one shot with the frame, and then you turn the page, and there's like one detail and another detail, and maybe a detail of the signature or something like that. And that's considered like a valuable image if you're like thinking through the work as a reader following along with the writer. Um, but then I feel like we're losing something with that diminishing importance of the installation shot because it's sort of the last connection to the actual physical space that it's in and that kind of social context and everything that was in the room. Um, it would be beautiful if there were a way to capture kind of the, the social activity that the critic or the writer was experiencing while they were viewing the work rather than the kind of empty gallery shot. The empty installation shot is always kind of the biggest lie, right? It's neither the work nor the way that it's actually experienced. Have you ever been, I love that situation when you're like standing outside the glass doors of the gallery and somebody's like holding you out while the photographer finishes, like going up and down a ladder, taking those perfect shots of the work in the space that will never be seen that way again. It's interesting because you're actually, in a way, in your presentation, you reverse completely the roles because there is somebody that is watching you right, and documenting your daily, um, there's a fe fetishization, not in a judgmental sense, but there is a fetishization <laughs> of the role of the critic in the work, in your presentation, and it's, I wonder how, it, how did it make you feel to be watched? Um, 
It's interesting you say that because we're actually trying to do more kind of like looking together in terms of experiencing situations together rather than like me doing my thing and then being shot. Like it wasn't a runway kind of situation. Um, but there are some situations, a couple images where I would appear kind of usually like over the back or something like that. Um, and it's weird to look back at that and kind of think about what my bodily presence is contributing to the discourse that we're having about images um, in a way that I think artists are more used to. Like everyone loves that, again, really fetishistic shot of the artist like with their brush just touching the canvas. You know, every artist will complain that some stupid fashion photographer came to their studio and <laughs> they wanted to see me work. And so I just like picked up a dry brush and put it right on the corner of the canvas. Um, I guess it's a little bit like that, except you never see the vision of the writer writing, because it's something that should always go unseen. Yeah, it's, I, I, again, I'm kind of still interested in this moment of like this assignment being kind of really brushing art. And Diego, you have the moment of um, hold an Instagram shot of a magazine holding, the, like the, the photograph is a, of a person holding the magazine. It's an Instagram shot, which is a, a capture that you put in a kind of like, st st like a still motion. Um, that it's like such a, it's like reversal of, but a reversal of digitization of the image that it kind of brings it back to um, a new materiality. And I think that maybe it's also materiality, materiality that perhaps like ap appears on in Instagram at its best that Anne, you, you touched up on it. And I wonder about like this moment of like as, a, as writers, how to, f and it, the question is not, I did not pose, I don't pose the question well, it's a little bit ambiguous in my mind. But you have something that you reversed the image back to from representation to presentation, if it makes any sense. So like, b instead of talking about, you're making a visual argument. Well, in, in that uh, specific like frame to frame uh, little video, I found it in Instagram by the hashtag art magazine. <laughs> and I found it very, very funny that the, the gallery was posting a video of their own advertising in the magazine to turn it again in the Instagram. It's the same thing that you're saying, that you're saying. They, they send the, this advertising, that the magazine prints it, so the only moment that the galleries was, was expecting was to have the physical magazine in their hands to open it and share that they are in the Art Forum magazine. Advertising just besides Perotin. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's just uh, if, when I saw that, it was so funny to see how magazines have been just uh, downsize into advertising. Just if you advertise in the magazine, check. That's that's beautiful. That I, I'm there, p perfect. It doesn't matter if my artist has been written about. It doesn't matter if the, it's bad or ba or good review. It does. What matters is that I have an advertising in this magazine just by the sides of one of the top galleries of the world. And this cycle of re of presentation, representation. I digitalize it. I send it. It 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 it, it, it exists both in the physical, but kind of the galleries knows that in the physical world, uh, he doesn't control who sees it, uh, the, the advertising. So what they do is post a picture to make sure that the audience grabs attention of this moment. So that I, I found that very interesting, just, just with that tension of presentation and representation. I mean, in general, there's a lot less substantial content in print magazines these days. I mean, the younger generations, they're consuming their information by looking at an image and reading like a 15 second caption. And how much do you really get out of that? And I mean, look at Art Forum, for example, and their critics pick section. How many photos do they use to illustrate each review? No, th th they're basically one photo of one of the, of the exhibitions that they're reviewing. Uh, it's, it's funny what you, what you say of this velocity. I was, I was thinking through, when I was going through all the images and thinking about the theme, uh, I, I couldn't avoid thinking that thinking on image nowadays, it's, as in, it's submitting yourself into an oversaturated and hyper accelerated rhythm of consumption. So I was thinking of what's the role of criticism in a world that is hyper accelerated. 
And what came to my mind is to slow down the pace, to, to make that moment that if your text grabs the attention, this text is going to be maybe three minute lect lecture, but uh, a three minute reading, I mean. And, but that three minute, it's a slowing down of this constant feeding of going through, the, through, through your Instagram feed or through your Facebook feed. So how can criticism appeal to deaccelerate the art system? Well, I think about this a lot at a monthly magazine um, where, of course, we love all of our advertisers very much and know that people spend a lot of time on looking at those ads. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really see the value of a monthly print magazine today um, in precisely the speed at which people are consuming it. Uh, and I think there's a slowness to it that functions as a counterweight to the broader culture. Um, and I think a lot of readers, uh, or at least people who buy the magazine, equate that slowness with a certain luxury. Um, it's a rare experience to be able to focus for even three minutes, five minutes on a text. Um, and so I, I see a future where that almost becomes a kind of status symbol, um, that you have the time and the headspace to devote to this kind of activity. Um, and so, I don't know, I see, maybe it's not a bright future, but at least some future for print publishing precisely for that reason, precisely because it de-accelerates while the whole world seems to be speeding up. I, w I was just having a conversation the other day about why Terremoto was still being printed. And although all, uh, there are a major amount of magazines that are closing, uh, one of the big, uh, let's say, characteristics of Terremoto is that, is that the printed issue exists in its own rhythm because the distribution, that Terremoto is, is small, so we appeal to, a, let's say, a long-term journalism. We publish one review every two, every two weeks, one, one uh, article weekly. So we, we're appealing for a more uh, not hyper-consumism con, uh, of, of information as contrary of, of most of the media platforms around our journalism. So when I was thinking about, well, sh will Terremoto st still be printing? Of course, that's the way we, we've been moving. We started passing our magazine hand to hand. We don't have this big distribution uh, network. We, we literally is posting on Facebook, who's going to Colombia, who can take one box, I can take a box, perfect. Take a box and give it to your friends for free. I don't, I, we, we don't sell the magazine, for example, because we believe that the printed issue should be more for the dissemination in, in a more community-based idea of, of passing it by, recommending it, like, oh, I read a, ver a very good article. Here, have the magazine, I have a copy. So that, that's, that's a way of, of, of from, from the remote that we were trying to question ourselves of how not to submit ourselves into this rhythm of production, of consuming, of... I think there's, there's, there's starting to be a contraction of the way that we're consuming information because of this overabundance of it and the way that it's exhausting us. I mean, I personally am overwhelmed with the amount of information and images I consume on a daily basis. And I've kind of made a cautious, conscious effort to put down my phone and not look at Instagram all the time. And I find myself looking at it a lot less than I used to like three or four years ago. Yeah, I think that there is something that you the connection of like, you know, the visual diet, I think that it's important and I'm curious about it. But before that, I think that there is um, like an outline that Will and Diego are, uh, are drawing that are, I, I'm not sure that it's the same map of um, the economical structures of the audiences and the, the question of privilege and luxury versus community. I wonder, you know, if they actually come together somehow. And it is a very important thing to kind of, I don't know, as a writer, um, to position yourself as a, a participator, a participator in the economy of arts and how you're positioning yourself. And I wonder if you have any, if you thought it, well, what, wh in what way do you position yourself in relation to the economy, in relation to how you support the economy as a big economy and also local economy? Yeah, I mean, I think about this a lot, and it's... Um, 
definitely at the forefront of my mind producing um, art in America. It's, it's a business, uh, and it's subject to the same economic forces that I think a lot of artwork is also subject to. Um, and I think that's a very important context for criticism. One of my predecessors at the magazine actually spoke really well about this. Um, Craig Owens talked about his reasons for working at Art in America vor versus working in an academic context, for instance. Um, and he thought that being part of the same kind of market as the art he was writing about allowed him to write alongside it. Um, because he was experiencing the same thing as the artist. Um, and I think about that a lot. I mean, that's kind of my guiding light, I would say. Um, we're selling the magazine. We're selling subscriptions and ads. We're not handing them out in a you know, community effort. Um, everyone at the magazine is involved in other smaller scale, usually publishing efforts that do kind of create the kind of community that Diego's talking about. But um, Art in America is not that. You know, it's many things, but it's, it's not that, you know. Well, on the other side, for example, Terremoto is the other side of the, literally, of the, of, of the coin, let's call it. Uh, we're, we're a free publication. We never sell it an exception of art fairs, for example, or bookstores of certain museums. Uh, the rest is free in all, in all the continent. And... Advert, in terms of advertising, that's an interesting conversation we've, we have with the, the director and, and myself, because we had a discussion in which she, she, tells, she asked me, what would you do if we uh, find uh, Chanel wants to, to advertise? I, will, I tell her, I will quit. Why? But it's money. We'll, we'll, it will keep us up. Yeah. But we're the same. That we're we, we will just be imitating the model that we're trying not to become to. So if we want to advertise, we're going to keep advertising as small galleries. Maybe the art fairs, because they have, they have money, we're going to advertise local labels or national labels, but I'm not going to advertise Chanel, Cartier, or whatever, because that, I, I'm, that's, not my, that's not what I'm looking forward. And it it's totally doesn't make sense with the content of our magazines. At the end, I, as an editor of the magazine, I truly, I truly believe that the content, that it's decolonial, feminist, and anti-racist, has, has to be in accordance to who we are, who we are uh, creating alliance with co as clients. So if that doesn't go together, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in being part of the project. So we, we're, we've been discussing it constantly because Terremoto is right now in that moment in which we're shifting up. It, it, it's been five years now since we created the, the, the magazine. And we're in that moment in which, in which the, it's overwhelming to be uh, covering a whole continent, specifically the South. So we're in that moment in which we have to step up. But that's the question that we've been reflecting recently. How we want to step up? Like we want to step up imitating the models that have been imported from the, from the US specifically, because our platforms in Mexico had a lot of influence from, from the US uh, uh, communication media. But we want to be that, or we, uh, we want to become an art forum eventually? Mm, no, I don't want to be that, to be honest. Luckily, Terremotus is still more content than advertising, for example. So we're just estereotizing uh, and, and thinking a model of how to keep this possibility of being independent and autonomous without depending of these big names to keep it up. How do you raise your funds? How are you that's, financing the publication? That's 70% uh, of, the, of the funding comes from pa patrons, collectors, mm -hmm. uh, uh, gallerists. Uh, you don't feel beholden to them, though? And yes, but they do not, they do not uh, are part of the editorial process, for example. They do not uh, say, oh, I don't like this contest, content. Uh, when, they give, when they give any uh, amount of money or whatever, mm -hmm we make very specifically to tell them that you're, you're supporting, thank you very much, but you're supporting autonomy. So that means that your money is, doesn't mean that you're, I'm gonna review your shows, doesn't mean that I'm going to publish your artist, it means that you believe in our vision as an editorial uh, uh, team, and you're, you will not be part of, the, of these discussions. If you believe we, we're doing something wrong, you're open, you're, there's a conversation, of course, but that your, your support doesn't condition our content. That's always, uh, that's always something that we keep uh, with all our patrons. So we have a board, let's call it, mm -hmm. and the rest comes from uh, advertising, mainly through Art First, because they have, they have the funding. We don't charge, for example, the small galleries, 
uh, and some mid galleries we we do agreements. Okay, you cannot pay this, but maybe you can pay a, a little amount. So it it, dep it also depends on one to one with the client. So mm -hmm. we, we're trying to keep that possibility of having the control ourselves. Yeah, as someone who's written for both like niche art publications and mainstream publications, I find that publications that cater more to the luxury lifestyle uh, market, we're often beholden to our advertisers. And for certain publications uh, to which I contribute, I found that I'm not always free to say what I want to say because of it. And it's really frustrating for me. So uh, are you, do they just edit things out or um, how does it? I, so for, for, uh, so sometimes I have to like fight to keep something in, yeah. and sometimes I I can't have a voice because we get so much money from X or Y or Z advertiser. Robin, did you had any issues um, or um, situations that you put yourself in in relation to economy of publishing? Um, of course, but I I. I don't want to talk too much about my past roles because I'm not with that magazine anymore. I feel like it would be kind of unfair to share the inside stories these days. <laughs> um, and it's only been a short amount of time, so I don't yet have any new stories. Um, I guess the only thing I can say is that I love that you guys have such strong and clear positions on whether or not your magazine is a business or community effort because in the Chinese context where I operate and have operated, that's not a, a conversation that is had really at all. Um, everyone is kind of imbricated in very complex situations, being beholden to certain parties, sometimes for financial reasons, sometimes not. There's also community support. Um, I mean, we were an art magazine that was almost totally funded by luxury advertising, um, just because of our parent company which I think was a very interesting role to be in, in the sense that you can say anything you want about art, uh, but you can't say anything you want about Chanel. And I guess it depends, as a writer, how much you care about being really negative about Chanel, right? If that's like a meaningful, critical position to take for an art critic, I'm not convinced that it is, but I could see someone wanting to include that there. I mean, I'm also a fashion writer, and you can't really dive deep into fashion criticism unless you are a super established critic, because what will happen is the brands will cut off access to you. But I mean, that it's different with the art world, of course. Yes, but or have you? Has anyone <laughs> experienced that? In my experience, most art galleries that are supporting magazines don't. They care more about the fact of a review existing than the critique being offered. Um, so whether you have a good or bad review, that goes into the, the gallery book. And in a sense, it turns back into an image again. I mean, your text becomes an image signifying that someone has authorized this work or um, an expert has weighed in and essentially told collectors that, yes, this is something relevant and important and worthy of discourse. Um, and that's sort of depressing, I guess, when you think about it. But, um, but that is how sometimes reviews operate, just as pure images. Well, th that was the intention of the Mimi, of yeah. the sandwich board men. Yeah. Because at the end, I, we've had a lot of, of, of discussions, even fights with galleries in Mexico, that is that, that they are requesting the review. And it's like, no, sorry, I'm not going to review you, because <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not obligated to review you just because you're supporting us, but we've been supporting you for, a, oh, beautiful, and thank you, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna review you. If you do a, a nice program and I consider it goes with my editorial line, I will put it in, but if not, I'm not obligated to do it. But it, the criticism has become the way, of, the way to, as you say, speculate around the work to give it value so the gallery can position it in the market. So at the, at the end, the question is also how can criticism, can, can, criticism can detach from that and create its own pace and its own terms of practice? Well, I don't think, for me, it's a question of detaching from it. Um, I, I think what you can do is communicate on multiple levels. So you can acknowledge that what you're doing exists as this image 
functioning in the economy, serving uh, the commercial art world in a certain way. But there's always something more. Um, I mean, I talked about art in America as a business, but and it does function like that, obviously. But maybe there's something else in that review that's reaching five, ten people that's a little bit more than just a market function, that has more of that community function where you're engaging in some kind of real discourse. And that's the point for me. Uh, the reviews can be read on multiple levels like that. I like the number, five to 10. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like the goal is it's like really reaching is five to 10 people. <laughs> that's enough sometimes. Uh, Will, I'm, I'm curious about, you used to work at Triple Canopy before Art in America. What's the difference in those two models of disseminating information? Is it based on, because the other one's not based on advertisers as much as Art in America is. Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, Triple Canopy is a nonprofit um, publication that produces a website, books, and public programs. Um, and so there are certain forms of writing that can exist there that couldn't exist in a commercial for-profit magazine. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I feel like maybe we should take questions from the audience <laughs> <laughs> before I get into this. And um, I, can, I can talk endlessly about this, but, um, but really it's about the different genres of writing that are linked to different economies of publishing. And before we take questions, I just wanted to say thank you so much to the whole panel. I mean, for the scene, we've been organizing these art, critic, art critics forums for the past two years. And I ran a little bit fresh out of ideas on how else to approach contemporary criticism. So thank you all for taking on the assignment in such a beautiful way. Um, Robin, Diego, Will, Ann, and Ruslana for moderating. Um, I want to everybody just to give a, a round of applause. Um, and are there any questions from the audience? I'll pass around a microphone. I have a question. I can. Okay, we've got one there, one here. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, one of the biggest criticisms of criticism in general is always that it exists in a bubble, um, it, that it's, you know, its own, mo, you know, monadic kind of thing. But does criticism as it currently exists in its present crisis, existing in a bubble, or has it been backed into a corner? I will say we're still in a bubble. Even uh, since criticism transforms itself into an image, at the end, this image is consumed in individuality. So at the end, the writers, uh, almost all writers, tend to talk about individual exhibitions. What I believe is that this uh, focus is specifically on individuality, you call it the gallery show or the group show, it doesn't matter the amount, but if it's this a specific only event, it isolates it and isolates itself, the, the writer, from the rest of what's going on around. What, I'm, what I try, for example, when I commission texts, I try, I encourage the writers to locate what they want to review in a more broader context not only in the art world, but also in the social political context, but since we're, we're writing about Latin America. And so uh, to avoid that individuality, that ephemeral uh, consumption of the text, and try to achieve a possibility that the criticism is historicizes uh, the uh, scene or the locality that, is that that exhibition or that show is, is it, it's where it's been exhibited. That's what I'm trying, but I, I do believe that we're still in a in a in a in a bubble, and also thinking about the way in which this series of of texts become an archive. For example, how can we resignify that existent archive of previous uh, reviews all around the world? How can we re Brought, bring them to, uh, again to, to the present. How can we dialogue with that past? How can we like? How can we resignify that archive of pages and pages and pages of criticism to avoid that they become isolated by themselves? That's something that I've been thinking a little bit. I, I agree with that, and I think it has a lot to do with the genre. And I think what you're saying about kind of the stuff that gets snapshotted and like literally sometimes it's a screenshot that gets printed out and then put into the, the gallery's binder, right? Like 
it happens mostly with reviews and with artist profiles, and then with those short things at the beginning of the magazine that are actually just short artist profiles. Um, and I feel like when people are able to work around that, like you said, to contextualize it, to kind of make up their own thing and string together 10 different artists or whatever and kind of talk about a movement, a moment, something more exciting, it tends to have a much longer shelf life and it tends to be more of a, a text and less of something that can just be kind of screen capped, right? Uh, I think in the last couple of years, we've been in kind of a golden age of like critics collected writings. Like there have been six or seven really great books just in the last year um, of things that have been written sort of throughout the 80s, the Gary Indiana criticism book, for instance. It, and you read back in some of that stuff and the exhibition reviews, you kind of immediately flip through because you weren't there, you don't know what the space looked like. It's kind of an uncomfortable little micro world. Uh, but the more expansive pieces really can still read as literature, and I think that's sort of the goal of criticism, is to kind of transcend that image exegesis sort of situation and kind of become a, a literary body in some way. Because there was also this, uh, let's call it, model of criticism that developed, let's say, by the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, that it's very popular from Art Forum Art Review, that is practically paraphrasing the press release uh, describing, literally describing the works that we can see in an image uh, that accompanies the text and just adding a qu two questions, opening two questions. That was like a constant, see that I was watching like, who invented this model? Like, why are we appropriating in Mexico? 500 words. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's 500, 500 words. Like, words. Just there. I think the problem is that the word limits are so short these days. Like, what can you say? Because what in art form, it's what, 250 for critics? It's something low. Like three, I think. For example, what? Like how can you say anything in, with that short of, amount, of an amount of space? For the review section in Terremoto, that it's not printed, it's just online, uh, our, our work limit is between 1,500 and 2,000. Okay. It, it's, I'm, what we're trying to do is to persuade more of critical essays that review exhibitions. Yeah. No, not really this consumption, but uh, let's, let's try to create a, a genealogy. Let's, let's try to create a discourse that when you go to this section, even if we publish one every two weeks, overall, you have like this genealogy of what's going on in relation to this whole region that we're, that we're trying to cover. So that's, I also noticed that, that it, why are reviews so short? So when I, when I step into Terremoto, it was like, no, let's do long essays about reviews. Yeah, because by the time you're reading about the exhibition, there's no more room for criticism. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I actually think that we should have another name for the the snapshot texts because they they don't they they, they they do not have a critical uh, claim in them whatsoever. And best case scenario, they just outline what is in the show, which is exactly like the press release. Gold star to the first art magazine that titles its review section "Lip Service." <laughs> you guys all have magazines. Maybe you can try out. <laughs> There was another question there. I don't see who, oh. Um, I wanted to pull a couple of thoughts in the discussions that you had, mostly around the idea of the speed of information and the speed of images, and how that kind of leads to a point where their ideas are kind of divorced from history, partly because of that infinite scroll that's kind of a condition of like the current moment. And I wanted to ask where you guys see or if you see a benefit to like negative criticism or some sort of pushback against ideas in a moment where sort of having to explain so much context and past uh, when you're trying to have a position um, as a critic um, isn't allowed because of word count and because of the lack of attention. How do you guys deal with that? Well, I mean, in terms of negative criticism, I don't know. I guess it, for me, it, the word count issue isn't the dominant one there. It's more just like a will to have a, a critical perspective. Um, and I think I've seen people who can do that in 200, 300 words. Um, but I think it's harder in that format. Um, I don't know. The issue of Art in America that was distributed, I think, has a really important critical essay in it um, about exhibitions at the ICA in Boston and at the MCA in Chicago on um, the effects of the internet on contemporary art. Um, 
and it, it really pushes back on the framing of that idea in these two major shows and proposes a, a new way to go about it that's precisely about historicizing the internet and treating the internet as material. Um, so in a way, I think those two exhibitions have reproduced the logic of, of speed and um, you know, lack of context that we're all complaining about probably. Uh, and museums and galleries need to do more, I think, to put that back into their own programming, especially when we think about contemporary art. So if they're not doing it, then the critics do it. Um, and I think not a lot of critics see their role in that way. Um, but I think it's really important. Yeah, I think that it's an obligation of a critic to position the work in history and present. And it's the, the, it, it is exactly how like you have to describe it and you have to contextualize it. And then you can actually say what you think about it further than that. I'm not, I'm not sure. Mm. Because, well, in, Me in Mexico what happened is art, uh, criticism, in the, art, the, the history of criticism comes from self-organized uh, group of writers, mainly poets and narrative uh, writers, that then they self-organized, founded their own magazines, and they start, let's say, opening a dialogue and, create, and describing or narrating what, what's going on uh, during the context that they were developing. Uh, in one point, the critic is substituted by the curator. And the curator becomes the one that positions, describes, and let's say justifies the artwork. And the critic becomes this public publicist guy that is just writing about exhibitions so, so the magazines can get money from the galleries. So at the end, the the my my understanding of the of critici of criticism today it's more linked to def to defend the writer the, sorry to defend the artist through criticizing what he's doing but not in terms of positioning it in history but in positioning in itself like in his in its own practice if we're talking about individual works if we're talking in group shows that i there is a necessity of of, put, of inserting them in history to create a genealogy to th i do believe but i don't know what else do you think yeah, I mean, I think the point I, I was trying to get at is one that you touched on, which is that I think a lot of the best criticism today focuses on the curator, actually. Um, and I, I wouldn't say, you know, everyone talks about the crisis of criticism, whatever, but I think there's a real curatorial crisis going on, um, which is that there's a lack of historical understanding in the curatorial profession um, that's been celebrated for the last decade. Um, and I think the tide <laughs> needs to really shift there. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of very historically aware critics who are prepared to confront that challenge. Well, I think that the both, both fields, um, some of the, you know, they're freelancers in the sense of like there is no um, clear place that, it, it is not a clear discipline. You don't go to, there are some schools that would teach you art uh, journalism, yes. There are some schools that will teach you curatorial practices, but these, if you compare the curriculums between the different schools, you will not find a lot of similarities yet. And there is something about the both uh, occupations that are not, um, it is not yet, in a, it's not yet disciplined completely. And I think that in that sense, it's both the, um, the fun of the uh, occupations, but also their weaknesses, their pores to influences that perhaps are um, strange to the practice itself, foreign to the practice themselves. I agree, because that's, let's not forget that if there is a male gaze canon, it was critics who built it. Not curators. Curators was it's a, it's a new figure. It comes from the 90s, 2000s. That's that's like what I think uh, curator, curatorial practice is in it's in a crisis, because it's so recent that it hasn't taken the time to reflect on its own practice. 
On the contrary, criticism comes from a, from a long genealogy. So what you say makes, makes, makes sense. At the end, criticism is the one that positioned this narrative that we're trying to criticize in this present. But at the end, we're just, let's say, these things that you find that are they're contrasting between the, those curriculums are, are because criticism positioned the, the, let's say, the contents of the curricula of art practice, but the, the journalist practice is not itself being updated to the times yet. I agree aside of the fact that the curators had like, you know, in same amount of responsibility excluding women and people of color throughout history from the canon. Like it's, a, it's not only the critics, critics that did not write about them, there was an institutional effort that was curatorial. criticism, but also I think it's happening, um, I don't know if this is on, or, oh, now I'm back on, okay. So, um, so on one hand, I guess, we're talking about this apparatus that is changing the way that we see the world, it being Instagram or social media, and it is in, you know, making the dissemination more to the masses, which can be on some ways interesting and productive and generative. But then also we are talking about this crisis um, and I don't think it's only limited to the art world. I think um, all industries are experiencing it in one way or another, but we can stay in the art world. My question is that how do you think this crisis is productive in the sense of continuity that we can have? Because now there's also, um, it came up that like how do we keep up or how do we keep referring to the archives that we have? How do we not isolate them? And I just wanna see what your view is on this crisis and how that eventually has to, you know, um, it keeps moving forward. And I wanna see if you see any positivity um, in this kind of crisis as we move forward. And, uh, um, yeah, I do. I, I think it's great that people are becoming hyper-literate in images, and I think it's possible to foresee a form of criticism that is purely image-based. I mean, I think we were struggling <laughs> with that <laughs> assignment, but um, maybe people who have ac really been raised on the internet, so to speak, um, won't have that problem, that it will be second nature. Um, you know, there are modes of art that, in a way, constitute this kind of criticism already. I think a lot of appropriation art is essentially art criticism by other means, or image criticism by other means. So, like when Richard Prince uh, appropriates an image, um, that's not just stealing, I think he's criticizing there in a certain way, um, and making that argument in a, in, to some degree through his own work. Um, so I can imagine something very productive happening there um, as people become more fluent in this language of image consumption. I will say that the positive side, it's memes. <laughs> memes. Okay. Uh, how do you call it in English? Meme? Memes. Memes, oh. I'm call no, now. I'm calling them memes now. Memes, now. <laughs> 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 memes. well, there is a text, I forgot uh, the name of the author right now, uh, but I can look it in my phone after this if you're interested, that it's called Meme Politics. And it's a text produced in the South, of course, and at the end, uh, this author departs from the context that in the South, uh, of in, the, in the South of Latin America, in a, in, a lack, in a system that lacks of education and that relays on consumption of images and a spectacle as a way of uh, articulating the masses. 
this person uh, proposes that memes are the way to insert critical thinking. So memes, for example, in Mexico, so, uh, uh, and specifically, are a very powerful way of disseminating critical positions of the state towards the state or versus the state, produced only by, the, by its own population. It's not as does the government is generating its own memes, no. Memes are, the government is transforming to meme to point, to point out critical situations through, let's say, comedy or through uh, acid uh, laughs, let's call them. So this text really position it's more and contextualizes more of the of the possibilities of memes as a way of of unfolding a critical thinking i found that it's very interesting if we're if we're totally going to the image then let's think about the how the image is being used now to position critical thinking so and the first thing is memes yeah, I agree. I think that like it's a you know the beautiful thing of a meme is that it's an image of text and text that they they create a break in a second and the repetition of them is this, so there's like this neurotic it's like the loop the endless loop of the break that it, it actually it, cr it it does shatters continuity um, and I th but and I think that it is really good point to like in relation to like the post-internet um, and kind of art production and the production that is in a constant present tense. But we should not forget that the other half of production that we can see is a production that is obsessed with history and archive. And I think that these are major forces that are operate completely at the same time by the same generations also. We can say like the young artists that are like 20 to 27, they're obsessed only with the internet, but it's not true. Also what we see in the art school is not true. There is real desire to touch history. And there's, I think that that is a very interesting moment that both forces operate at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, that was the announcement that um, the fair is closed. <laughs> and we all have to go. Um, thank you. Oh, okay.